Enantiomers are very, very similar in their physical properties. They have the same melting points and boiling points, for example, the same vapor pressures when in pure form, all that good stuff. But one physical property on which enantiomers differ, which is important both historically and practically even today, is called optical activity. And it has to do with the interaction of a chiral material, which is either a pure enantiomer or a mixture enriched in one enantiomer over the other, interacts with a plane polarized light wave. In this video, we're going to look at the phenomenon of optical rotation or optical activity, touching on the physics just a little bit, just enough to understand why this happens, and then we're going to look at sort of the quantitative implications of optical rotation, seeing how we measure it, seeing how optical rotations of an enantiomeric pair are related to each other, and how we can use measured optical rotation to get a sense of the enantiomeric composition of a mixture, basically answering the question, how much of one enantiomer, say the R enantiomer, do I have? relative to the S. And we'll look at enantiomeric excess and enantiomeric ratio, which quantify these amounts of two enantiomers in a mixture. Let's start with optical rotation as a phenomenon. It's actually a fascinating phenomenon, in my opinion. So what's going on? Well, let's talk about light. Light is an electromagnetic wave oscillating through space. And a plane polarized light wave is one like you see in light blue here, oscillating in a single plane. Here it's a vertical plane, and we can see the, electro, uh, the electric field vector oscillating up and down in that plane. This is a plane polarized light wave, and the wave itself is a chiral, right? It's oscillating in a plane. The plane of oscillation is a plane of symmetry of the light wave. So a plane polarized light wave is a chiral. However, we can think of a plane polarized light wave as two helically polarized components. So let me turn off a couple of the um, waves here and just focus on this red light wave now. This is also a light wave. It's an oscillating electromagnetic field, but the oscillation is occurring in a circle. So this is what's known as a helically polarized light wave, and you can think of it basically as the threads of a screw. Just like a screw, this is chiral. This is a left-handed or left circularly polarized light wave. So this red wave is chiral. And we can also think of a right-handed circularly polarized light wave that is also chiral, but is kind of like a right-handed screw as opposed to a left-handed screw with the electric field vector kind of circling in the opposite direction. When we add these two together, we get a plane polarized light wave. And so although the superposition or the addition of these two helically polarized light waves is achiral, the individual components are chiral. And a chiral material will interact differently with the red and green enantiomers, quote unquote, they really are enantiomers, of the helically polarized light here. And that differential interaction creates optical rotation. So let's talk about how that works by now adding a material into the mix. So the first thing I'm going to do is turn off the helical components and show you what happens when optical rotation occurs. Optical rotation happens when the material is, is chiral, is enriched in one enantiomer over another, and this creates a difference in the index of refraction with respect to the red and green helical components. So for example, wave one, which is our left-handed circularly polarized light here, might have an index of refraction of let's say 1.10. Um, for, uh, for uh, this light and then uh, for that material, and then an index of refraction of one for the green component rotating in the opposite direction. This difference occurs because the two components are chiral and enantiomeric, and a chiral molecule interacts differently with the two hands of some other chiral molecule or phenomenon. What we can see happens here is a rotation of the plane of polarized light as a result of the slowing down of one of the handed helical components relative to the other. And this is optical rotation. And we can measure it as this change in angle from the vertical, perfectly vertical, to this new plane of oscillation when the light wave comes out of the material. That angle is quite commonly referred to as the optical rotation.
If we turn the components back on and actually eliminate the superposition, you can get a sense of why this occurs. If you look really, really closely, you'll notice that what's happening here is the red wave is actually slowing down with respect to the green wave. So there's a change in the phase of the right and left-handed components as, it, as they, they move through this chiral material, and this creates the rotation of the plane polarized light wave. So the physics here isn't super important, but I like to show this off as it emphasizes the general point that a chiral substance in this orange box interacts differently with the two enantiomers of another chiral substance, that's the basis of stereoselective reactions, or a chiral phenomenon like this, like a helically polarized light wave. So we just noted that although the vast majority of physical properties of pure enantiomers are identical to each other, because they have essentially identical intermolecular forces, they've got the same internal distances between all of their atoms and between all of their molecules, hypothetically speaking, creating equivalent intermolecular forces, they differ in how they interact with plane polarized light. They cause a rotation of the plane of polarized light, due to this difference in indices of refraction for these helical components of a plane polarized light wave. To measure this, we make use of a device called a polarimeter. And the principle of a polarimeter is delightfully simple. On one side, we have the light source. The light source is completely unpolarized with electrical components, components of the electric field in all directions. We send that through a polarizer, which only lets light through that is, in this case, vertically polarized like this. Inside the polarimeter tube is our chiral material, that orange block in the simulation, and if the, material, if the sample is chiral, then it will rotate the plane of polarized light by some angle. To measure that angle, we've got an adjustable polarizer on the other side of the instrument, and we rotate that until we observe light coming out the other side. At the angle where we observe light coming out the other side, we know we've hit the angle of rotation caused by the sample inside the polarimeter tube. So we can measure this optical activity or observed rotation, as the slide mentions, using a polarimeter. One thing we should note before leaving this slide is that the extent of optical rotation, the angle of rotation, depends on a number of different experimental variables. The wavelength of the light source matters. That's going to affect the index of refraction, right? So the wavelength of light matters. The length of the tube matters. Roughly speaking, we'd expect more rotation for a longer path length of the light through the sample. Temperature matters. The concentration of the chiral sample, say we're analyzing a uh, substance in, chiral substance in solution, the concentration of that substance matters. So observed rotation is an extensive value that depends on a number of experimental variables. To sort of deal with this, we make standard measurements under standard conditions and kind of divide out things like concentration and the path length of light through the sample to take those dependencies off the table. The standard measurements typically use the D-line in the emission spectrum of sodium metal. This is a standard wavelength that we use at a standard temperature of 20 degrees C. And then we divide by the concentration in grams per milliliter of the sample and the path length in decimeters of light through the sample. And this gives what we call the specific rotation. And this quantity is characteristic of a compound. We can say, for example, that R2-bromobutane chiral compound there, when in pure form, has a specific rotation. You'll hear me refer to it as an alpha D, colloquially speaking, of negative 23.1 degrees. And the units here are actually degrees, right? This is the rotation under these standard conditions of one gram per milliliter and one decimeter path length. Now, something to notice here, if we look at S2-bromobutane, is that the specific rotation of S2-bromobutane is equal but opposite in sign, equal in magnitude but opposite in sign, to the specific rotation of its enantiomer. So specific rotations of enantiomers have equal magnitudes but opposite signs. In essence, they have mirror image indices of refraction, right? And, and so if any difference in the index of refraction in the R enantiomer is mirrored with the same difference but with the opposite sense of rotation of the light in the S enantiomer. And something we should note right here is that in general we cannot predict the sense of rotation, whether it's, for example, positive clockwise or negative counterclockwise, 
um, or the magnitude of rotation for a compound from its molecular structure because optical activity is very much an emergent property. It depends on any intermolecular forces that might exist in the sample. It can depend on the solvent used. Um, and so this is not an easy thing to predict from the molecular structure. You know, it's not, it's not like spectroscopy in that regard. Certain functional groups don't cause particular values of optical rotation. And we've previously seen that we can use RS labels to indicate the configuration and that these labels will differ between a pair of enantiomers. You can also use optical rotation to refer to enantiomers based on the sign of optical rotation, since the the specific rotations are equal in magnitude but opposite in sign, the sign of optical rotation can be used to designate or name the enantiomer. For example, we could refer to this right-hand compound as plus bromobutane since the sense of specific rotation is in the positive direction, plus 23.1 degrees, and we could refer to the R enantiomer as minus 2 bromobutane since the sense of rotation here is negative 23.1 uh, degrees. And this is common for um, sort of old school compounds for biomolecules with a lot of stereocenters, such as the amino acids and carbohydrates. It's more common in a biochemical context, I would say, than RS labels, which are more commonly used for sort of laboratory organic compounds. But you'll see this naming convention used for enantiomers, where the sign here in parentheses indicates the sign of optical rotation. You'll also hear the terms dextrorotatory for the um, enantiomer with positive specific rotation, and levo or levo rotatory for the enantiomer with negative optical rotation. Optical rotation provides us a means to measure the enantiomeric composition of a mixture. A solution of a, or sample of a single enantiomer is what we call enantiopure, optically pure, or enantiomerically pure. And it's going to have the maximum magnitude of optical rotation observable for that sample, for, ex or for that compound. So for example, R2-bromobutane, in, in a sample, a pure sample of R2-bromobutane, the specific rotation observed is negative 23.1 degrees. If we mix in some of the enantiomer, the observed optical rotation will become more positive or less negative will move towards zero up to a maximum value of positive 23.1 degrees in the case of enantiopure S to bromobutane. So the pure enantiomer provides the limits of observed optical rotation if we're thinking about that substance mixed with its enantiomer. At kind of the other extreme, we have an equal mixture of the two enantiomers. A mixture containing equal amounts of two enantiomers is what we call a racemic mixture or racemate. And because we have equal amounts of the two enantiomers which rotate plane polarized light in opposite directions, right, the observed optical rotation for a racemic mixture is zero degrees, no optical activity at all. But if we have a slight preponderance or a large preponderance of one enantiomer over the other, well then we do observe optical rotation. And the specific rotation we observe is going to be between the positive and negative specific rotations of the two enantiomers. So this provides us with a means to determine the enantiomeric composition of a mixture. Roughly speaking, the more extreme the observed rotation, the more enriched the sample is in one enantiomer or the other. And the optical rotation that we observe, the observed specific rotation relative to the specific rotation of the pure substance, is linearly related to this quantity called enantiomeric excess. And it's essentially how much more of one enantiomer do we have relative to the other. So to calculate the enantiomeric excess, we think of it as a percentage. How much more do we have? What is the difference in the amount, essentially, as expressed as a percentage between the greater and lesser enantiomer. That's the enantiomeric excess. And we calculate that by taking the ratio of the specific rotation we observe divided by the specific rotation of the pure enantiomer. Absolute value, so that this is always positive. Enantiomeric excess is always reported as a positive value, and usually will indicate the enantiomer some, in some way with, say, an RS label or a plus or a minus, something like that, um, after the percentage. And then we multiply by 100% to get the, the EE. Now, EE is not super intuitive um, because it's, it's not the amount of the greater or the, the 
enantiomer there in greater amount. It's the difference between the greater and the lesser amounts. Enantiomeric ratio is much more intuitive. This is the ratio of the two enantiomers in the mixture, and it can be calculated from enantiomeric excess, or EE, by saying, okay, 100% plus the EE of the sample divided by two, this is the amount of the major enantiomer in there. And 100 minus the EE divided by two, well, that's the minor enantiomer in there. And I wanna give a quick example of this on this slide. So, for example, let's say we had an EE of 90%. An EE of 90% doesn't mean we have 90% of the dominant enantiomer in the mixture. It's not a 90-10 mixture. The enantiomeric ratio is 100 plus 90 divided by 2. That's if my math skills serve me right. 95%. Let's say it's 95% R. And the S enantiomer then, well, if you do percentage math, this means that the minor enantiomer, the S enantiomer, must be there in 5%, and this also follows from the formula, 5% S, and this is the enantiomeric ratio. A lot more intuitive, I think, right? 95 to 5 gives you exactly a sense of how much of one enantiomer we have versus the other, but enantiomeric excess is still used in some cases because it is directly proportional to the observed rotation, so it's quite an easy calculation to perform. Let's nail down our understanding of optical activity and specific rotation and EE and ER with an example problem. So we've got adrenaline, which is a chiral compound. Optically pure adrenaline in water has a specific rotation of negative 53 degrees. And let's imagine that a chemist had devised a synthetic route to produce pure uh, adrenaline, but suspected that the product was not pure, enantiomerically or optically pure adrenaline. It had some of adrenaline's enantiomer mixed in with it. So he or she went and measured the specific rotation of their product, and the result was negative 45 degrees. Now, by sort of inspection of the two optical rotations, we can see that the product mixture is not enantiomerically pure. Um, if it were, then the specific rotation observed would be negative 53 degrees. This slightly less negative value indicates that there is some of the other enantiomer mixed in there. The question basically is, how much of the other enantiomer is in there? Let's calculate the percent EE, or the enantiomeric excess of the product, and we're also going to calculate the enantiomeric ratio, just to drive home what that is, and get some perspective on what the EE actually means. So, here's our formula for EE. It's the observed specific rotation of the sample divided by the specific rotation of the pure enantiomer. And here, I just sort of arbitrarily chose the plus enantiomer. You could use this negative 53 value directly. It's entirely up to you, right? Because the magnitude is the same for the two enantiomers, and we're gonna absolute value off that negative sign if there is one. Anyway, and then we multiply by 100%. So when we apply that here, we've got negative 45 degrees for the optical rotation of the sample of the, the product, and we have positive or negative 53 for the optical rotation, the specific rotation of the pure enantiomer times 100%. This comes out to 85% EE. Now, what does this mean? Well, it doesn't mean an 85 to 15 ratio of the two enantiomers. To calculate the enantiomeric ratio, we use this formula. 100 plus 85 divided by 2, well that's going to be the dominant enantiomer and the minor enantiomer will be 100 minus 85 divided by 2, and if my math skills serve me right, this comes out to 92.5 to 7.5. And one thing we should notice is that this minus this, 92.5 minus 7.5, is 85%. This is essentially the definition of enantiomeric excess.